Good morning. Welcome to worship at Blacksburg Presbyterian Church. I am so glad you are here today. Whether you're here in person or online with us right now or later in the week, I'm glad you are taking time to worship. This is a community where all are welcome, no matter your age or your ethnicity, your marital status or your economic situation, your sexual orientation or gender identity, your disability or difference, no matter what, you belong. Sarah Wines has some notes about our life together. Good morning. As usual, I invite you to fill out the friendship register, pass it down, make sure you know who you're sitting with. On this first Sunday of our season of creation, we'll be showing the film Chasing Carbon Zero in the Fellowship Hall after worship. We invite you to come. We have lunch from Panera and an op- with an optional donation. The film will be just under an hour and an opportunity for discussion will be provided afterward. The film asks the question of how the U.S. can reach net zero climate emission by 2025 and talks with the scientists and engineers who are convinced it can be done. Next Sunday, I think that's supposed to be 2050. 20, yeah. I just, I just read that, so that's not right. 20, 2050. Next Sunday, we have a creation care fair. The first since 2017, we'll have nine booths of information, games, and activities for all ages. Snacks will be provided. The creation care team has been working hard on this fair, and we hope you'll join us. And as you go through the gathering space today, you will see two other things for Creation Care. One is, in the gathering space, a slideshow of photos sent in by BPC folks of moments of wonder and awe. And you can add to this. Send your photo, no more than two, to Elizabeth, photos, no more than two, to Elizabeth Day. The other thing is a bulletin board with some helpful information. So watch out for that. We'll give you more on that. But it's, it's up now. Um, Several events are starting up, continuing for adults. Please read the calendar and the bulletin. Newcomers are welcome. And along that line, um, Hildegard Circle will not be able to meet at Jan McGilliard's house. And so if you have not let either me or Jan know that you're coming, let one of us know so that we can tell you where the alternative meeting place is tomorrow. Now I would like to call on Larry Wyatt to tell us about a special event coming up soon. Good morning. My text for today is from Philippians 4.4. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Next Sunday, September 17th at 4 p.m., we get a twofer, a violin and piano duo who are world-class musicians presenting a free concert on behalf of the Women's Resource Center of the New River Valley. The, new, the Women's Resource Center was established 45 years ago, and this noteworthy uh, 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 group advocates for victims of sexual abuse and domestic violence. Due to circumstances beyond their control, the WRC needs an outpouring of faithful community support. Government funding for the WRC has been reduced by 60% over the past three years. To continue to thrive and serve, they are seeking increased community-based support. BPC has been an advocate for this essential outreach organization for years. Come on the 17th for both enjoyment and to serve as a Christian advocate for social justice. Being Christ in action is what makes BPC so special. Our performers, Jeffrey Hurd, violinist, and Anna Petrova, pianist, are on the faculty at the University of Louisville. They are in our community as guest artists at Virginia Tech. Jeffrey is founder and director of the Geneva Music Festival, and Anna, who is Bulgarian, has been recognized by the United Nations for her work with refugees throughout the world. I'm asking for your support, not only to attend the concert, but to invite friends who might be interested in such an event. Further, there are other opportunities for service to the Music for Mission series. We need about five to eight individuals who might adopt a portion of our community publicity work. 
The work would involve perhaps a half hour of your time submitting information about the concerts to our uh, various publicity outlets. If you would be willing to spend 30 minutes on your computer four times a year in this endeavor, please get in touch with me. For now, I hope to see you next Sunday for our Music for Missions concert. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Larry. And we invite you all to the gathering space um, for refreshments and fellowship after worship on your way to the film or not, whether you're going to the film or not. And now let us center ourselves as we begin worship together. The Lord is my song, the Lord is my praise. All my hope comes from God. The Lord is my song, the Lord is my praise. God, the wellspring of life. The Lord is my song, the Lord is my praise. All my hope comes from God. The Lord is my song, the Lord is my praise. God, the wellspring of life. Please rise in body or in spirit. The Lord be with you, also with you. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Rejoicing in this day, we say welcome. You who still have dirt under your fingernails, from that one garden bed you needed to tend before you came to church. Welcome, you whose feet will never forget the feel of wet grass between your toes and the chill of mountain streams. Welcome, you who marvel at creation and despair at the damage we've done. This is a space and time where we can celebrate beauty, lose ourselves in awe, grow in gratitude, lift up lament, and be rerooted in the source of life who makes all things new. Come, let us worship.
God of the mountain and valleys, oceans and streams, cities and towns, we open our hearts to you. Hear our prayers and hymns of praise. Fill us with hope. Gently heal our brokenness and touch our hearts with your love. Open our hearts to your presence and help us love you every day of our lives. Amen. You may be seated. Made in God's image to live in loving communion with our maker, we are appointed earth keepers and caretakers to tend the earth, enjoy it, and love our neighbors. God uses our skills for the unfolding and well-being of the world so that creation and all who live in it may flourish. But often we neglect our task. Recalling our purpose brings us face to face with the ways we've gotten off track and gives us the chance to begin again. Trusting the one who made us and calls us good, let us confess the ways we wound our lives and the life of the world. God of all creation, you loved us into being, yet we often flee our rightful place in your creation. We confess that we exploit the gifts you place around us and dominate the richness of the natural order. Forgive our greedy grasping. We confess our part in the devastation of our planet home, mirrored in the violence of cities and the brokenness of hearts. Forgive and restore us. Nurturing God, remind us of other ways to live and of a place called home, where creation reflects your goodness and each thing lives in balance. Give us the hope we need to change and start again. Come and find us and it's right again. Take us home. Amen. Good, very good. Those are the first words God spoke over us, and they will be the last word. In baptism, we are claimed and reminded that we are children of God, not because of anything we do or don't do, but because God loves us. So friends, here. And trust the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. We're going to sing our peace. The peace of the earth be with you. The peace of the heavens too. The peace of the river.
Let us greet one another with a sign of peace, and as we do so, I invite children to come forward, including today sixth and ninth graders. The peace of God be with you. Um, oh, I'm on. Okay. Good morning. All right. Can, I'm going to pass these little, I have some backpack tags for you guys, sorry. Um, I'm going to pass them around. So just take one and then pass the pile around. I'm going to keep one. Take the whole pile and pass one along. And same here this way. Um, actually, that's a lot. I'll tell you what. Henry, I'm going to give you a bunch of those. Can you take one of those and pass them that way? Just pass them around to everybody. Okay, can anybody tell me what this backpack tag said? They're, they're coming around. Okay, just pass them around that way. What, what does it say? Can somebody read it to me? Yes. Be loved, be kind, be you. Be loved, be kind, be you. So let's talk about that for a second. What does it mean to be loved? How does it feel to be loved? Yeah. Yes. It feels good to be loved, doesn't it? Yeah. Anybody else have a comment about that? Who loves us? God. God. Yes. God loves us. So when you know that you're loved, it, um, for me anyway, it gives me a really strong foundation that I know, okay, I might make a mistake, but I know I'm loved. I have a good, strong foundation. Um, so the second one is be kind. What, um, what, what does that mean? What does that mean to you? Or how do we do that? Yes. Do nice things. Do nice things. Clean up the living room. Oh, clean up the living room. That's awesome. Yes. <laughs> um, and, and what gives you, um, what, what helps you be kind to people or be kind to others? Thank you. I think knowing that I'm loved and I have a strong foundation helps me be able to be kind and share love with other people. So I think that, that, that being kind comes out of knowing that I'm loved. And the last one on here says, be you. What, what do we say? What does that mean? How can you be anybody other than you? What, yes? Doing what you love, doing what you um, usually do. Doing what you love. So that's an expression of how God has made you. That each one of you, each one of us, is we're all a little bit different. God has made each one of us exactly, exactly the way we're supposed to be. And um, it's a way of honoring God and a way of honoring yourself that you can share that with other people. What makes you a little bit different or a little bit special is that God made you that way. And so whatever that means, celebrate that. So one of the other things we're going to sell, so, so you can keep these on your backpack this year or whatever, wherever you might do, or, and we have some extras if you want to share them with, with some friends later on. I'll, I'll leave the extras out in the gathering space. Today we also want to celebrate that um, some. this is kickoff Sunday. We started Sunday school this year, um, today. Um, we want to celebrate that some of you have reached milestones in your, um, in your schooling. So some of you have started kindergarten or will start kindergarten very soon. Um, and so we want to give each one of you, I'm going to stand up so people can sort of see me. But um, I'm going to, um, we have a book called When I Pray for You. It's a really, it's a lovely picture book. And so we're giving that to each of the kindergartners and I'll read their names. So I would, um, would like, if, the, if there are any kindergartners that are still out there, come on up and you can receive it. And I, I want you to kind of stay together and standing up here. 
So our kindergartners are Alice McClure and Lillian White and um, Audrey. Audrey, are you a kindergarten? No, I'm, I'm going You're first grade. I'm sorry, that's right. Okay, Alice and Lillian, can you guys come on up? And Miss Susan will give you a book. And if we have any other kindergartners in here that I haven't named, because I'm, I'm always afraid I'm going to miss somebody. So if there's, oh, Robert's in kindergarten. Robert. Oh, my goodness, Robert Lyon. I know. I'm so sorry. Please, thank you. I'm so, always so sorry that I didn't get an, every name on every list. Um, okay, third graders, since you are um, in the Bibles, the third graders get Bibles um, because you are getting more fluent in your reading and more um, in your maturity. So our third graders are Matthew Drumheller. If you can go up and Miss Susan will, will give you the, your Bibles. Matthew Drumheller, Henry Evans, Eli Fleming, Airly Harder, Avery Kruko, Hattie McClure, Henry Stewart, um, and Ethan Scott. Good. Yeah, Miss Susan has the Bibles. Um, and again, if there are any other, any other third graders, um, we, have, we, we would love to give the Bible to you. Okay, sixth graders get a book called 100 Things Every Child Should Know Before Confirmation. Um, this is not a textbook. Um, it's <laughs> and you will never, ever be quizzed on it. But, um, but it's just a really good review of, of lots of, uh, of kind of biblical knowledge, but also concepts. And it's just, it's just a good refresher. Um, so our sixth graders are Carolyn Drumheller. Carter Eschenman, Jonah Fairchild, Asher Fleming, Kaylin Galladay, Cole Harder, Peyton Kruko, Reed Lawrence, and Nettie Stewart. Okay. Um, and ninth graders, you all have started high school this year. We have a lovely book of... Um, poetry and, um, and little kind of exercises to do in your mind. Um, anyway, this, this book of poetry is called Remind Me Again. Um, and so this is for our ninth graders. So ninth graders are Kate Byron, Jaya Erickson, Jillian Lowe, Reese McFall, Maggie Moore, and Heidi Schwartzwelder. Again, if we have any other ninth graders here, I would love to hand one out to you. Great. So one more thing. We have all these lovely students. All these lovely students need the support of lovely teachers. And we have a lot of teachers in the congregation. So I want to recognize them um, for the, the, love, the dedication and love that they share with these students and with the adults. So our children's, and it takes a lot of people, um, the children's teachers this throughout this year, are, and I'm, I would ask you to stand and stay standing to the end, please. Phil and Susan Bailey, Bethany Brownfield, Catherine Cleland, Ben Coral, Marsha Parks, Mary Lee Hendricks, Marilyn Hutchins, Meg Lang, Heather Lawrence, Rachel Parson, Janet Rakes, Melanie Spencer, Heidi Schwartzwelder, and Claire White. That's just children's teachers. Now keep standing, youth teachers are Jonathan Anderson, excuse, uh, Julie Berger, Russell Drumheller, Colleen Drumheller, Jenny Fairchild, Natasha Lowe, Todd Lowe, and Ben Wyatt. Now we get to adult Sunday school teachers, and that is uh, Jonathan Anderson again, Jack Call, Anne and Greg Campbell, Russell Gregory, Emily Rhodes Hunter, and Sarah Wiles. Let's say a prayer. First of all, just look around the, the sanctuary um, at this many people. Yes, well, we are getting it. Definitely. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for the gifts of these students and the gifts of these teachers. 
Be with them and in their conversations throughout the year. Help them see you and share your love in the world. Amen. Thank you very much. Open wide the window of our spirits, God, and let your spirit blow through. Ruffle our feathers a bit. Open wide the door of our hearts, Jesus. Be with us. Speak to us. Challenge us and make us whole. Amen. So we begin our season of creation with this story about an old prophet named Jeremiah. Jeremiah lived during the final days of Jerusalem before the Babylonian Empire came and conquered and destroyed the temple and much of Jerusalem and sent the remaining residents into exile. The story is from Jeremiah 32, but it is 1,200 words, and I am not going to do that to us. I'm going to tell you the story instead. Jeremiah was not a cheerful guy. He was a realist. He told people how it was, and they didn't like hearing it. So he got locked up and driven away and thrown into a well. Nobody wanted to hear what Jeremiah had to say. He said, the Babylonians are coming. There is nothing you can do to stop it. So you need to figure out how you're going to live in light of it. When this story takes place, the Babylonians have laid siege to Jerusalem, and they are about to invade. And Jeremiah hears from God that his cousin, from whom he has been estranged for years, is going to come see him and try to sell him a piece of land, and that Jeremiah should buy it. Now, this was not a booming real estate market. But his cousin shows up, even though they haven't talked in decades, and sure enough, his cousin does want to sell him a field. And so Jeremiah buys the field, even though that doesn't make any sense, even though it is a terrible investment. Only a fool would buy land that the Babylonians are getting ready to burn. But Jeremiah buys the field. And then we get this long description of the details of the real estate transaction, apparently closing on property was just as tedious then as it is today. The deeds are signed the signatures are witnessed. The papers are lined up nice and neat. And Jeremiah says, roll them and put them in clay jars so they will last a long time. And I wonder, what was going through his head as he did all that? 
I imagine him starting with this sense of, okay, God, I mean, this is another weird thing you're asking me to do. Then I wonder, as he signed paper after paper, as each signature was witnessed, as the deeds were rolled and put in those clay jars, if he began to see meaning in what he was doing. That's often how it is. In the doing, we discover what we believe. Jeremiah is investing in this land, literally, even as it is about to be destroyed. He's investing in it. An investment is an expectation of a future return. An investment presumes a future. God's been promising a future after Babylon. Pain and suffering are coming. They come for us all. But, says God, they do not get the last word. There will be life after the Babylonians destroy your world. So buy the field. And as he does this and wraps those deeds and puts them in the clay jars, something changes. He's no longer just talking about a promised future. He's part of it. He's participating in it. He is staking a claim that this land will one day be farmed, be fruitful again. We could shake our heads the way the people there that day did and say, this is just foolishness. It is meaningless. It is a symbol. And what we need is a whole army. It doesn't change anything. The Babylonians are still going to come over those walls and destroy everything and everyone in their path. Jeremiah's never going to live on this land he just bought. He's never going to farm this field. Everything he and his people have known is vanishing. We could shake our heads and say, it's useless. It's just a symbol. And yet, it was apparently more than that. Because they remembered. They told their children and their children's children. And some of them returned to that land. And some of them rebuilt. And here we are, half a world away and two millenniums past, and we are still telling the story of crazy old Jeremiah buying a field when the world was ending. It was more than just a symbol. He acted as if there would be life after Babylon. It is a posture of hope. It must have been so hard to believe, to have any measure of hope. Their world as they knew it, was ending. Our world, as we know it, is ending. It's not overstating it. You know 
as well as I do. Hottest days on record, temperatures incompatible with human life, oceans as warm as bathtubs, rivers and aquifers drying up. We could go on, but I won't, because you know, and I know. I struggle in the face of that with despair. Maybe, maybe you do too. Things are going away that will not come back. No matter what we do. So much of the world that humans have always known is already gone, or will be, before some of us in this room are gone. The passage from Jeremiah, and hopefully this sermon, are not finger-waving accusations or declarations of sin or a long list of shoulds. You all know all of that. You don't need me to recite those shoulds. This is not that. This story from Jeremiah is something else. It points to a way to live meaningfully in the despair, in the reality we find around us to maintain some remnant of sanity and humanity and hope. There's no reason in the world for Jeremiah to buy a field that is going to be destroyed. But he does it anyway. It's nothing more than symbolic action. But it turns out, that's not nothing. We do these kinds of symbolic actions all the time. And I don't think we give them their due. Like what we do here each week in worship together. It's largely symbols. Every week we act out a symbolic drama of praise and honest confession and forgiveness and peace and illumination and community and renewed commitment. We read words in unison. We match our breath as we sing together. We move our bodies in ritual ways. We look around at each other. We are not alone. We say prayers that have been said for generations. Every bit of it is as symbolic as Jeremiah buying that field. It is as essential as what he did. Because what we are doing here is enacting with our bodies a different reality. A reality that begins with gratitude and praise. A reality where confession comes easily. A reality where peace descends and there is enough grace to go around. We do that week by week. And it works on us like water on stone. It changes us. It takes some doing to believe there is life after Babylon. Jeremiah can't change what's coming, but he can choose hope in the face of it. And he chooses to act as if there will be a future as if God's promise 
will stand. and He is going to invest in it, place his flag in that plot of land. The story is told that Martin Luther was asked once what he would do if he knew the world were going to end the next day. And it is said that he answered, I would plant a tree. He bought the field. We can plant the tree by the field in countless ways. And we do. You do. I see it. We fill our land with pollinators, plants that don't take too much water. We walk back to the car to get the grocery bags, the reusable ones. We choose the glass communion cups over the plastic even though they are considerably more work. We cut meat from our diets, and on and on. And we do all that, and we know we'll not save the pygmy three-toed sloths, or the Sumatran elephant, or that one last white northern rhino. We know what's happening will take profound changes at every level. But instead of giving in to that despair and powerlessness, we have a choice about how we live, where we place our trust, what posture we take in relationship to the world. We could slide into despair. But do you remember that time crazy old Jeremiah bought a field before the Babylonians came? We choose how we will live, how we we will respond to the gift of life that God has given us. We choose. Do we buy the land? Plant the tree? We choose where we stake our claim. We can choose to act with hope. We can choose actions that testify to life, that participate in the promise, that embody a faith in a future we can't yet see. But trust is there. And those choices, slight as they may seem, are a way to believe with our bodies that life endures. God's will will be done. That the promise stands. There is life beyond Babylon. So by the field. Amen.
seated. Children are great at teaching us about hope, irrational hope even. So I have a project for the kids this morning, something I need your help with. So if any kids who are here could come forward, you're not going to have to talk or perform, it's something fun, I promise. Y'all could come up, and there are a few adults who've agreed to help. We can just stand in a circle. Okay, I'm going to turn off my mic so I can tell them what's going on. One person and then my back on, yes, great. So as Christians, our hope is rooted in the waters of baptism. The first life came out of the water. Water refreshes us, renews us, cleanses us. Jeremiah is the one who talked about streams of living water. And in baptism, we die and rise again with Christ. One ancient way of remembering our baptisms and celebrating them is for the priest or acolyte to take a branch and shake water on the congregation. The kids are going to do that for us today. You will get wet. I hope you can feel that as hope dripping down, covering us, promising that life will be renewed. 
As they do that, we're going to sing the song on your insert. Larry will guide us first, and then we'll join in. Starting from today, behold, behold, I make all things new. We promise is true, for I am Christ the way. Behold. y'all so much. Once you've given back your branch, you can head back to your seat. Friends, all that we have and all that we are is a gift from God who loves us, who covers us in renewing water. And so we give back for God's work in the world, not out of guilt or shame or obligation, but out of joy and gratitude. Come, let us rejoice in all we've been given and all that is ours to give as we receive the morning offering.
All that we are and all that we have are gifts from you, most generous spirit. And clench our hands from grasping, free our hearts from the need of having, and channel our work into sharing your generosity among all your children. Amen. like reason for hope, I hope you'll join us for lunch afterward and the movie. Wherever you go, go with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the unending love of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, this day, unto your life eternal. Amen. Amen.